Welcome to episode 216 of Come On You Reds, the leader, the front runner, the gold standard for Toronto FC podcast. And that's according to my unofficial billing. Uh, greetings to you all wherever you are, from Etobicoke to Aaron Mills, from Leslieville, where I am, to Listowel, Ontario. On this week's episode, miscues against Montreal end in a 4 2 loss in the regular season opener. Richie Lorea, baller, but for how long in Toronto? We're going to ask that question today. Opening weekend impressions from the 26th season, the kickoff of Major League Soccer and the Super League. Well, right now, anything but super. I'll tell you who is super. It's my co-host, your friend and mine, former Toronto FC midfielder and apparently original cast member of Love Island. It's Terry Dunfield. I am Gareth Wheeler. Is that true or false? Maybe your Wikipedia page needs to be updated. Where did you get that from? <laughs> I just figured you'd be an interesting cast member to watch on a show like that. I'm kind of intrigued, though, I'll be honest. <laughs> I don't think acting is like that. <laughs> no, not at all. That's why I said original cast member. Oh. Back in the day, Terry, right. when you were some big wig footballer, you know, living a lavish lifestyle, looking down on people like me, saying, I'm yeah. not going to talk to you. The big wig's definitely gone, but... <laughs> What a, weekend. Uh, what a weekend of football, heck. Great weekend of football, but now with the Super League news breaking Sunday night, it's still very much a work in progress. Doesn't it just make kind of everything else seem rather in- insignificant at this time? Like Jose Mourinho was fired. We do this podcast Monday mornings. It's like, Jose, who cares? Super League. Like that's where we are right now. For sure. It's, uh, and that's kind of like, my takeaway from the move itself, it's it's bigger than us. It's bigger than football. It's almost like there's this elitist group and they can do whatever they want, regardless of what the fans want, what's best for football. It, it reeks of so, almost like a big M&A merger. And uh, there's no vote. There's only a guarantee that fans are going to get good games. So uh, deal with it. We will deal with that a little bit later on. By the way, Terry's, uh, you know, a four a former Man City player. I'm a lifelong Manchester United supporter. So uh, I think that our kind of thoughts and our emotions and our takes are a little bit all over the place. So we'll kind of walk uh, through that with you a little bit later on. Of course, it was a big weekend across Major League Soccer. Toronto FC playing Montreal, known as CF Montreal, as Terry likes to call them, the snowflakes. Uh, not anywhere across the 401, instead in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, where Toronto FC fell 4-2 was the final. When you concede in the third minute, Terry, it never sets up for an easy day, especially when you can see the second, you know, just 20 minutes later on. It seemed like it was going to be an uphill climb for the get-go, playing in the hot, hot heat of Fort Lauderdale, you know, three days after you went on and did something special in the Champions League with a limited side. Um, it sounds like I'm making excuses. I'm not Chris Armis, so I can go down that road. I just think that they're realities, not excuses. And, and overall, a disappointing result in the first match. Um, maybe let's go through some of your observations, some of the things that stuck out from you from the 4-2 loss. Yeah, I, I think you touched on most of it. I, I think you've got to look at the context coming into the game before it even kicks off. And just as you were talking then, Wheels, it's it's almost as though the impacts, right, uh, CF Montreal were a little bit... I do that all like the time. A, by, I do that all the time, by the way. I think we're going to have like a swear jar, jar every time that... We say impact. We just put like a dollar in there. Then, you know, when we're allowed to, we'll go to the pub and have a good time. Nice one. Impact, impact, impact. No. Oh, uh, Terry owes a fiver. <laughs> I, I think it was a little bit like what Leon, what we, we were like Montreal, Leon were like us. And uh, Montreal had all preseason to, to build for us. And, and the way they set up to play against us was purposeful. Uh, they knew that their counterattack was going to be a weapon against us. And, and then you look at some of the other contexts, the heat, the games played in the Florida sun at two, two in the afternoon. It's absolutely roasting. There's zero recovery time from the midweek game. We've got a thin roster. So I think that we were always going to be up against it. And then, and then you look, go even deeper into our style of play. 
And I think with tired legs against a team that's, that you know is going to get after us and prepared for us, uh, this system has holes in it. And I, and I thought they were exposed. Yeah. Um, the lineup, I, I saw comments. Well, why hasn't Armis or why didn't Armis refresh his side? Um, it's very difficult, isn't it? Especially when some players that are available to you, like Moro and Deleon, they're probably not at a level where they can play 90 minutes in conditions like that at this point. So I think you are very limited by the, um, by, by the squad or the, the team selection, I should say. And when you concede early in the third minute, I mean, that just makes that much more of an uphill battle. I think we documented over the course of those two games against Leon in the champions league, how good Auro junior was a couple of mistakes by Auro further up the field kind of led to the break on the first two Montreal goals. The first one coming Mason toy. It was a great finish, but you know, Auro's upfield slips. It's a three on three. The Montreal Impact do a great job job drawing Omar Gonzalez over. But I got to give Mason Toy a lot of credit, the player who finished on the goal. It went top corner, but I thought his positioning was great, Terry, making himself available at a good angle to receive the ball and punishing the error further upfield by Toronto FC. Yeah, it's uh, it was a, it was a great finish. I thought Omar got dragged just a little bit too far over, uh, which which gave a little bit more time and space, and the angle was just a little bit nicer for Toy, and, and he wasn't maybe under pressure to, to finish, but it, he curls it into the top corner. It's funny, all four goals go over Bono's left hand, top left hand shoulder. Right. Um, but I but again, it's it was a tough goal to swallow because it, it comes from a mistake. It wasn't necessarily great play from from the impact. Yes, they were good in transition, but um, I, I I think with Alro playing on the wrong side of the field, that mistake he comes inside that that mistakes made kind of in that inside channel rather than if he was a natural left foot or out wide. So now the impact of breaking from the middle of the field, Rogi are so quick and. His way to pass was, was nice for Toy, and it, it was in the back of the net. There was a couple early signs as well just before that where Montreal, a little bit different to Lyon, just played over top of our midfield wall and dropped a couple balls into their front line. And now all of a sudden, our back four were exposed at times. And I think that this is the homework the MLS teams will do against TFC. It was an MLS version of Chelsea. That's kind of the way that Montreal played in this kind of – uh, you know, three, four, two, one, or wh whatever you like, seven defensive players, two wide players in front of a back three, two holding midfielders right there, and they just stay very compact. But I thought that the way that they attacked pulled Toronto FC's defenders out into some unusual positions, Terry. Much different than Club Leon when you're playing in a much more standard formation, when you want to keep things limited in the middle of the park. Montreal kind of did their damage and forced Toronto FC into these awkward positions defensively from wide areas. When we were chatting with Chris Armis and we were talking about, you know, we've only just begun and, you know, we're only kind of seeing the tip of the iceberg, what they're going to do defensively. I think it just showed a little bit of inexperience defending in the shape that Toronto FC is when you're playing a team that plays a different formation. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. It just felt like the fullbacks and Lorraine and Arrow were getting drawn out and the central midfielders were getting caught a little bit too high just everyone was a step off and maybe a little bit unsure about who to take or what their defensive responsibility was in certain situations. Yeah. I, I think we saw that on the fourth goal, um, yeah. pitches where, where Moro kind of steps, he's not able to impede forward progress and all of a sudden our center backs are exposed. And um, I, I'd say there's two reasons to that wheels. Uh, great point. One would be, I think it's our guys just trying to figure out the system, the nuances of it. And each game is going to be a little bit different with, different with reference points. And um, the, the picture is not always going to be perfect. The cues aren't always necessarily going to present themselves. And I, I, I put this down to teething issues um, within the new system. And, and then also to the context of the game, it, it's now changed. You're, you're down to no pretty quickly. You're chasing the game. So to kind of sit in that middle block and wait for your moments or, or begin to set traps is – is maybe not at front of mind kind of thinking tactically. It's almost like, okay, we've got to go get that ball back. That's within our game model. And uh, I, I thought at times we were forcing things, which actually opened up some space for the impact. No kidding. And it, 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 
<laughs> it, it, yeah, another six dollars. Uh, an, another part of the context, uh, and it matters. 2 p.m. Fort Lauderdale, Florida, 30, 34 <laughs> degree heat. Like, I, I'd love to sit out and have a, you know, a, a margarita in that weather. But <laughs> when you're coming off the game Wednesday night, you're forced to play a midday game in that heat on a much bigger field in fairness as well. You get a little bit stretched and you could probably speak to that, how difficult that is if you're feeling a little bit leggy already. The only time that happened to me was the Honduras 8-1 game when we played at 2 oh, o'clock. Yeah in Taguzi Gelp. It's horrible. It's hot. It's, it's uncomfortable. You're tired. You're already banged up. And I think it's exposed even more. And, uh, you, you know, it's the start of the season as well. Don't forget that. And, and I think in big moments, we, we just looked a little bit leggy and I, and I don't think that the heat helped and whoever signed off on it, um, there's no competitive edge for TFC there whatsoever, especially being a home game. Well, it's it's the power of David Beckham. It's Inter Miami Stadium. They had a big game, you know, 3 p.m. on Sunday. They want to make sure there's enough time for the field to be patched up, recover. I mean, this is part of the makeshift life that these Canadian teams are living right now. And there's probably some of those scheduling quirks when it comes to Toronto FC playing at Exploria where Orlando City plays. So unfortunately, that's kind of the reality of the situation. Again, not trying to make excuses, um, but they are the realities that the context matters here. The thing was Toronto FC had chances to punch back. Schaffelberg missed one right after the first goal was scored. I want to save talking about the second goal because we're going to discuss the young players a little bit later on, Terry. Mm -hmm. But right before the end of the half, TFC get that penalty. Arrow did really well splitting the defenders, taking down inside the area, even though his penalty was absolutely a shocker. It was in slow motion so much so that T-Hop was dragged off his line. Uh, Delgado steps up and takes a penalty, but you're kind of going into half thinking, okay, you got one back, 2-1, this is manageable. I, I, I actually thought that Toronto FC were going to get something out of this game. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's funny. I think I was in three group texts at halftime. So I was talking with you. I was talking with Chris Schufelt. And I was talking with a couple, a couple of academy coaches and Shuey and uh, the academy coaches were like, oh, we're in trouble here. We look tired. And, and then I get this text from you and it's like, it's not that bad. We're, we're in this. And then I look at the stats and I'm like, our goal is expected is like 1.4 to their 0.34, whatever it is. There's nothing in the game other than maybe a mistake, a Kyoto, you know, moment of brilliance from him. I'm going to give it to him there. But we weren't that far off. But probably maybe what I underestimated was the toll the first two games took on us, the heat, and how thin our squad was. Yeah, I, I didn't think the team played that bad in the first half. I, I honestly did not. And I think that they ran into a brick wall in the second half. Um, Mullins, right, right before the, the halftime whistle went, and we didn't have benefit of the replay, but, I mean, his header came close. That just went past that far post. There was a penalty shout where a foul wasn't given um, when Waterman and Camacho tag team to try to slow Schaffelberg down. Nothing was given there. Didn't have the benefit of the replay of that either. So it wasn't as if TFC were completely devoid of chances or ideas. But then again, second half starts. Wanyama scores in the 54th minute. Really good set piece. Michael Bradley will want that back. Didn't feel the big man coming, but Wanyama, that is a perfect header. Like down into the turf in front of Alex Bono, big skip up and over. Uh, you got to give credit sometimes to the player. And that's what Wanyama can do. He is a a Premier League talent for a reason. And he punished Toronto FC and just maybe a little bit of ball watching on that set piece. But the delivery, Terry, taking Bono out of the play, playing it a little bit deeper, it was well executed. It was. I thought I thought Wanyama was as good as I've seen him all game. I thought, I thought he caused problems. It's just his, his power in midfield. And I thought on his own, he was able to just break lines with the ball, which created overloads and problems for our back line. Uh, the header at the back post, it's its a tough one. I, I've been there. Uh, you know you've got a beast kind of coming in behind you. He has probably uh, a physical advantage over top of you. He's got a run coming in on you as well. You're kind of set up zonal. I, I think the keys to kind of deal with that situation is you've got to be moving. You've almost got to pick up that run a little bit. 
and almost look for any kind of contact and, and maybe try to draw a foul there. Uh, but not again to take nothing away from the header. I thought it was a powerful header and um, again, indicative of, an, of another moment where we're just a little bit drained and, yeah. uh, and, and Wanyama, you know, makes it three, one. And now, uh, it, you know, it's, it's, it's tough to concede a set piece. And now you've got, let's be honest, an absolute mountain to climb. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It was, the stuffing gets knocked out of you too. Like you, it was not- more mental. It was more mental than anything, you know, just, uh, I, I, I totally appreciate what those players are going through in that moment. And the goal in the 71st minute, I mean, it came from a TFC chance. Um, and then Diop threw the ball out and it kind of, you touched on it. Moro came, then Arrow came, and then it just opened up things at the back. And Mihailovic, good player, um, good pickup for Montreal. I thought it was insane that MLSsoccer.com, between their 13 pundits, thought that Montreal was going to finish dead last in, in, in Major League Soccer. In fairness, I think it's crazy that they had TFC ninth, I believe, and Seattle eighth as well like don't you learn your lesson year after year these teams are right at the top of the league uh i want to save the lorea goal for the time being um were there any other performances terry that you want to kind of point out that you saw like i thought jacob schaffelberg again was very good down that left hand side just possessing that threat to get up and over i thought he was a constant nuisance and perhaps other than richie lorea who we'll speak about in a moment was toronto fc's best player on the field yeah i'd agree with you i uh, I thought Schaap uh, did everything but score on, on his one chance in the first half. I thought he, he, he took that well. Uh, nice composure to dink it over the keeper. I thought he looked a threat. Um, at times he tries to, as, as Chris Armas says, slash a little bit too often. I thought Montreal really protected the middle, middle of the field well. And some of our wide guys, the affordance of the space being given was wide. And sometimes we have to take that to maybe create, um, to try to move their fullbacks a bit wider, maybe try to overload them there. But yeah, I thought Schaaf was good. I thought Okello did fine. I thought Ralph was another level again um, from the first two games against Leon. I thought he was good. Uh, Richie was top man. And and I just say on our overall kind of performance, maybe an area that we didn't necessarily spend or a moment we didn't spend a whole bunch of time against Leon was our kind of destabilization phase. So us trying to break down Montreal and, and often Leon had a lot of the ball where we'd win it and we'd try to score or finish our attacks. But I thought we had uh, a lot of possession in Montreal's half and we were pretty narrow and, and that's by design. Uh, but it was, it was difficult to kind of, find gates to go right through the heart of Montreal. I thought maybe uh, there was a little bit of space out wide or we needed to just move them around when we had good possession in their half. Yeah, uh, not a disaster. I think a lot of people forget the beginning of last season. It was a 2-2 with San Jose. It, it's never perfect this time of year. Again, I'm just you know, at risk of repeating myself, playing in cup competition has its knock-on effects. If TFC don't play those cup games, um Perhaps it's a different story, but a fresh team, a motivated Montreal team with a new manager came in and did the job. Uh, 4-2 was the final. Uh, Let's speak about Richie Lorea. Uh, I thought he was excellent again throughout that match. It was 3-1 when he came in down that right-hand side, played the ball through the middle of the park for Michael Bradley. It just kind of caught him on his wrong foot, Terry. He hit it with his left. It went over the bar. You knew that he wanted it on the right. Like that was the last gasp. That was the last chance. Right. But Richie played that ball through, through the 18 yard box and Bradley kind of stabbed at it. Wanyama just kind of touched him from behind. I felt like if it was like, honestly, six inches more into Michael's body, it would have been into the back of the net. Um, but you saw that Richie was trying to create something pushing forward and he just did it himself really all by himself in the 88th minute. You saw him in the buildup, a Montreal impact player. Forgive me. I just forget who it was, but basically Lorea gave the get off me <laughs> out. Like just, you could tell, you could feel the frustration. And then he plays a little one, two with Jaquiel Marshall Ruddy he becomes a TFC player, the youngest player ever to pick up an assist his first in MLS, plays a little one-two game, goes whoop, FIFA style, (laughs) turned inside and bullies his way through two defenders and then a cool, calm finish in the bottom corner. 
that was a special goal. And it's kind of unfortunate that there were so many great goals in major league soccer over the course of the first weekend, because that would, it, you know, it will be in the running for goal of the week, but it probably won't get there, but it's deserved of a shout. <laughs> yeah. Great description. I could listen to that all day, man. Um, yeah. It's, it's, he's making plays out of nothing. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. Yep. And, uh, I've heard it watching all the games this weekend. He's taking the game by the scruff of the neck and, uh, he's making plays and, uh, shout out to Jaquil as you just gave one, a lot of young players there would, would secure it, would play safe, wouldn't play forward. I, I, I know it was all Richie, but that played a small part in it. But, um, Man, he's got a change of pace. There's a belief behind his game right now. I, I think that there's a responsibility now that, you, you know, TFC need Richie uh, to, to make plays. And, and, and that's a nice feeling. I, th- I think he's kind of moving up that, that kind of depth chart of difference makers at TFC. And, and probably the biggest one, if you look at our whole roster, and, and I'm Chris Armis, I'm like, Richie Larea is a perfect fit for my system. Right. Yes. The question is, and I wanted to bring this up. I mean, he's 26. I think we all read the reports of him being linked to a European move over the last recent weeks. He's doing it for country as well. Doing it for Canada. It's just an absolute gem that Toronto FC picked up. His position changed and full credit to the player. He continues to kick on and do special things. You just have to start to answer yourself, ask yourself, how much longer will he be a member of Toronto SC? And can TFC afford to, to get rid of him at this point? Because with Auro and, 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 and Lorea, I mean, that is a strength. It might be the biggest strength of your team right, da- right now, your fullback position. What do you make of the moves that are linking him overseas? Is he ready? We'll start off with that question. 100% he's ready. I think he has enough of a foundation. I don't have it in front of me exactly how many appearances he's made, but I think he goes over there uh, at 26, great age, in his prime, um, with, with a nice foundation of work where, you know, if it gets hard, I think that he, he's achieved enough where he can go back to, to what he's already done. So I'd say, uh, I'd say he's ready. Um, I would say if you look at him as a person and his journey, I thought TSN did a nice profile on him. The fact that he wanted to leave Toronto to grow, to push himself, to get out of the comfort zone says to me, he's a player that maybe isn't looking to get paid. I don't think we've got the room and salary cap anyway, uh, th- that just wants to build a name for himself in Toronto. I think he um, isn't necessarily motivated by money. He'll, he'll just want to keep pushing himself and, uh, he had a little bit of a late start in the game, so he's chasing time. Um, but I, I think that that would probably be the next step in his journey. And I, I think um, I don't see TFC standing in his way. I, I think it'll be a tough loss for sure. Um, but again, having said that, it's a crazy market right now. And um, and it's got to be a, a good fit for everyone. And thanks, Atiba, for <laughs> bringing this to light. <laughs> And saying, no yeah, the Sheik just want him. Just looking at the market, t- two fullbacks that have gone from, from MLS, Reggie Cannon just recently went to Boa Vista. I know he's younger. At Portugal. 22, yeah. yeah, 2.75 mil. Um, Yedlin was yet the, the one before that, 2.8 to Spurs, later went to Newcastle. So I'd probably say you're in a, maybe a $2 million kind of bracket, which says to me, oh, I'd rather keep the player. <laughs> Um, but, but I don't, I don't think you can stand his way. Right. That's what I wonder though. You don't want to stand in his way, but I think that Toronto FC, I think that the club is dead set on winning and they want to make sure that they take care of their own. This isn't a charity, Terry, like, you know, th- there is a contract, you know, that th- they gave him a new contract. I think that timing is everything. And I think based upon the unknowns of the summer market, just, you know, Coming out of COVID, when will there be fans in the stands? The financial hits that are taken that other clubs across the world have taken. I, I just don't think that right now is when you might 
receive the best value for him. And for Toronto FC is impetus to sell the player this summer, for example. Wouldn't you want to see this through a busy summer? He's going to be playing for the national team, World Cup qualifiers as well into the fall. I just look at January as being a better time. Richie, stay here for the season. See this out. You're such an important piece to our team. Hopefully the market resets. You can maybe even do... Um, you know, prearrange something where January is the time for the player to go. Uh, and maybe from a personal perspective, perhaps if more of the world is vaccinated, more borders are open, travel is much more free, that it might work for the player more on a personal level at that time as well. I just don't, I, I can't see TFC losing Lorea, selling him for whatever sum of money that is, you know, this summer with, you know, I, the timing has to be right for me. Yeah, I agree. And I don't think TFC need to be proactive. I, and I don't think Richie's the type of player um, looking over his shoulder and he's trying to, he's trying to, to, to nest, to leave Toronto, to leave MLS. I think he's, uh, he has the type of personality that he'll be focused. He'll be dialed in in the process. He's in a great place um, to, to win things, to, to continue developing the system, the perfect fit for him. So uh no, I, I think TFC signed him to a new contract. He's, he's in a good place. And um, if, if the right offer does come, um, that, then that's a different discussion. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that the uh, biggest price tag, the biggest transfer fee that Toronto, have, that Toronto FC has got for a player was Maurice Adu, their first overall pick in their first year. You remember this, I believe it was like two point. Six two point eight million pound. It worked out to roughly about five million Canadian because we joked that that money was going to be put into replacing the field turf at BMO Field and bringing in grass. It was thanks to that sale by Maurice Adu. I just think that this needs to be a record transfer fee, Terry. I, I think it needs to be over three million pound. Um, I think that that's the territory. If you want a player to come into your first team right now. Um, I think three, four, five million. Look, if if, if Don Garber is talking up Daryl DK, um, who's doing well in the league championship, being a twenty million dollar player, Lorea has got to be what twenty twenty five percent of that. Isn't that audacious to suggest that that's what he's worth? I know that he's older, but uh, he's a player that can step right into a team and fit the modern profile of an attacking fullback. For sure. And I think wherever he goes so at this age, someone's buying him to play. And it depends how desperate that club is to bring him in too, right? And, and I think that this is where the market is a little bit crazy. And if there's a good fit, may, maybe you can get to that number. And by no means did the MLSC want to sell him or have to sell him. And um, I'm sure Chris Armas wants to keep him for, for a push to win trophies. Right. Um, it's a decent conversation to have. And it's all the credit to the player in the club for the work that they've done to get to this, uh, to get to this point, another Canadian player coming through the club and getting some serious looks across world football. Uh, I want to talk about the young players, Terry coming out of off of the game, because I know that a lot of people have been high on what these young players and, and you can put a bunch of them in that category that we've seen earlier this season. Um, we saw Marshall Ruddy. I just mentioned him. Luke Singh, Jordan Peruzza picking up their MLS debuts. Prizo, Akello, Schaffelberg. I, I might be missing one or two more. There's been so many young players that have got a look. It's one thing to come out and have a very good performance in a one-off. What makes a true professional is doing it on a consistent basis. And I think that there will be some growing pains in terms of these players. It's not going to be a slam dunk every time out. I think we saw that a little bit on the weekend, how difficult it is to do it game after game after game when they're coming fast and furious. Yeah, it's, I'm actually going to go in a different direction to you. I, I thought the young guys were, were good. I, I thought they were better than good. I thought they were, they were solid. And at times, it was the young guys actually taking the reins of the game and, and, and trying to drive the team forward. And I, I thought our problem on the weekend wheels was more we were missing Mavinga, Zorio, Pozuelo, Josie Altador, Zavaleta, Io Akinola. And, and some of our senior players were were beat up from, from the Leon game, but I thought that the young guys acquitted themselves well. I'd say the uh, Kyoto goal wasn't on Luke Singh. I'd say Luke Singh's quick. He's, he's 
physical. I just say it's it's a moment of brilliance from Kyoto, and, and that's right in his skill set to run 60 yards with the ball and still have the energy to smash it into the top corner. So, um, no, I, I thought the young guys, again, acquitted themselves well. I think they're going to be a part of Chris Armis's plan. I don't think it's okay when everyone's fit, the young guys get pushed aside. I, I think you'll always see two or three in the team. I wanted to discuss that second goal where you're right. Arrow uh, lost control of the ball, you know, basically just uh, on top of the CF Montreal 18 yard box, Waterman clears it long and it's a foot race. This, this isn't a criticism of Singh, but this is something that he will learn. How many times do you see those savvy veteran defenders that might not have a step of pace on whatever player that they are guarding, but they do so well to get their body between the player and the ball. He just needs to take that one step. You, you see it oftentimes, the ankles come together, it throws off the striker. He doesn't take a direct path towards the goal. You just need to do something. If you can't get to the ball first, you need to use your body as a defensive tool. That's something that a young player will learn at that age. Like great finish by Kyoto. You're right. Special player. But at a moment like that, there's just different tricks of the trade, you know, on a couple of the goals where Luke was maybe pulled in various positions. He will learn based upon these experiences, just ways to utilize his body, just have a little bit more savvy in his game. It, it's, it's not a criticism. This is a guy that that's now just played two games for Toronto FC and both coming in a span of three days. Um, but that's something that I think the player will learn. And he's not the, he's not the only one. I, thought, I think that, we, that not every game is going to be a masterpiece when it comes to Prizo or Akello or Schaffelberg, like sclaffing at his chance in the fifth minute. Like not everything is going to be perfection, but these players are going to learn from their mistakes. And not even mistakes, learn from what other established professionals who are playing on a high level on a week-to-week basis, what they're doing in order to get that to that point. And if you're going to be a regular in the eleven. First choice 11 week after week, that's what you need to show your adaptability and your ability to grow and provide that consistency game after game. Yeah, well said. Um, it's, it's tough to see from the cam- camera angle uh, because it was kind of like a moment of transition. Then it's a long clearance and then sings in a running race, whether he could have been a little bit, whether he was too tight, whether he could have almost bumped Kyoto to, to win a bit of space. Maybe he was a little bit honest and, um, and, and he has an experience coming up against a Honduran international like Kyoto. And I'd, I'd say in the Academy or, or maybe through his experiences at Bromby, he's always won that race. He, he's never actually had to be maybe a little bit savvy to, to, to Nick and edge. And uh, yeah, m- maybe he learns from that experience. I, again, I'm just going to put it down to, to the quality of Kyoto and, um, again, just one of the frailties of our system that uh, it exposes that kind of channel down to the side of the center backs if, if you're not able to stop that forward pass. Right. Uh, th- this is my roundabout way of saying through these first three games, I think we've learned a lot about these young players and learned a lot about this team in a relatively short period of time. And the next phase for these players will be developing consistency because there's enough there to show, hell yes, they can contribute, Right. It's just how much and how often and building that, you know, that continued trust of the coaching staff. Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's just an evolution that we'll continue to see uh, in this group. Any final thoughts on that, Terry? You've worked with these players? No, I just, I, I just don't think you can underestimate the importance of having um, the right senior players around them to, to help them through it. Uh, so TFC lose 4-2. Uh, it was a really good weekend, first weekend across Major League Soccer. I found myself glued to Inter Miami and uh, uh, and, and LA Galaxy, uh, the star power in that building. I could swear that was Ty Domi, former Maple Leaf, beside Tom Brady sitting in the crowd. And apparently they're, two, they're, they're friends. Like, I know that Domi was interested in, in, in football, but I'm like, you're hanging with Tom Brady? What? The GOAT? Uh, th- that seemed a little bit crazy to me. Bex in Victoria. Then you have Phil Neville coaching, 
you know, a side with Higuain and Pizarro and Matuidi. Then the other way, you have former TFC coach Greg Vanny managing Chicharito. It was a great game. 3-2 win for Galaxy as well. It's my boy Chicharito with a couple goals. You saw what it meant to him. To me, that was a gold standard of games. and goes to show you that, honestly, still in Major League Soccer, star power matters. I know that it's become a little bit of a development league. We like to see the young players come in. Don't you like to see these established world star players come into the, this league, even if it is late, and still go on and show a trick or two? I, I love it, Terry. I think it just adds to it. Uh, yeah, I think so. I think uh, you, you, you look at the fixture list, come out, you circle that one, and then add in 8,000 fans are at the game. I think that, that makes a huge difference. Uh, lots of connections to TFC. I thought Victor Vasquez was phenomenal at 34. What a ball that was for Chicharito second. Um, and then you get a little bit of swag and drip and whatever whatever the young dudes are calling it now with uh, Chicharito and all his body language. And last year was so hard for me, making 12 million only or whatever it was. And I couldn't score, but I'm back now and I'm not eating cheese. And guys, I'm going to give you everything. So it's, uh, yeah, it's entertaining. Um, I, th- I thought the quality of football was pretty good. Uh, Higuain looks touch heavy. Uh, but um, no, I thought Pizarro was was, was excellent. K- Sasha Kleshton's goal with his left foot was um, just a moment of quality uh, under pressure to, to feel it in off the post. And um, yeah, I was happy for Greg. Um so, no, I enjoyed that. I enjoyed the Whitecaps last night. I think they've taken a step forward. Still think they're missing that number 10, but uh, they were as good or maybe a little bit better than Portland, which, which should set us up for a good game next week. The, the other standout moment was Carlos Vela being substituted off. It looked like he called to the bench for an injury sub, and Bob Bradley takes him off, and he <laughs> comes over. He's like, what? No, I was ready to go back on. So, so sometimes your reputation, your track record of not being healthy or reliable, it comes back to bite you. And that's what it did in that moment, right? Yeah, I mean, probably what's going through Bob said, there's communication for sure uh, from your medical team to somebody else on the bench will then say to Bob, he's out. And I imagine the initial feedback was he's done. And then he's coming off a long knee, long-term knee injury. And then maybe he's okay, but that's not been relayed to Bob. He's got his sub. Kind of, he's already got his plans in his head from the night before. If Vela, for whatever reason, isn't good to go, and he's now on to the next uh, set of events, and Vela's like, "Hey, coach, I'm good to go." And then it's uh, fair play to Bob Bradley for putting his hand up and owning it, even though probably it had nothing to do with him. But um, yeah, it's a tough one, and it's a long seventy minutes for Vela watching the game with a good knee after being out for so long. Well, at least they won. They beat the expansion Austin FC 2-0. Uh, it's just the first week, so nothing over the top. Um, two of the best teams, in my opinion, in Major League Soccer, Minnesota and TFC, are the teams that concede four. So not too much to read into it, just the opening weekend. But a good start and some good play across the board. You mentioned the Vancouver Whitecaps. They're next up for Toronto FC. 3 p.m. Saturday as TFC starts the season by playing the two Canadian teams, but not in Canada, in in Florida, where the snowbirds go anyways. Uh, Vancouver beat Portland 1-0. I watched this game as well. Our boy Cavallini with the goal. Uh, On one soccer, I predicted last week that Vancouver Whitecaps will be a playoff team. I I liked a pickup of Casado. Uh, Gaspar didn't play a new right back. Alexandra, who's a Brazilian central midfielder, he didn't play either. And I think they're going to go out and add another attacking player as well. Um, how difficult will that game be uh, against the Whitecaps next weekend? They look, they look a much more improved team, don't they? Uh, they did. They looked, uh, they looked happy uh, at Rio Tinto. They, um, I, I think the front office has done a little bit like TFC, a, a fantastic job of moving families down there, ensuring the players aren't in hotels, that the players are comfortable. Uh, and, and, and I think that that's paying dividends already. Same thing with Ali Curtis. It's come out that uh, families are, are, are going down to Toronto and maybe with us going into a lockdown here in Toronto, that's p- played a part in it too. But I think that's important. And then if you, if you, my overarching feeling last night was 
Vancouver are going to be a tough team to play against. There aren't as I didn't really see any holes in their in their team. I thought that they were solid throughout. Maybe missing a little bit of creativity, uh, but but they were very workmanlike last night. And I think if you create chances or, or get the ball into good areas, um, and, and I think that that's important for Cavallini. A little bit like Chicharito, he he thrives on a particular type of service. Uh, he'll he'll get you ten plus goals. It works for Toronto FC having a week off between games. <laughs> to be oh, honest, that, that that yeah, but that how, the, I think the team need, you need it at this time of year. You've been there before, Terry. Mentally when there's too many games early, like it's tough. Yeah, it, it, I mean, it takes you to tw- back to 2018, even 2012. In my days, it's tough juggling two competitions at the start of the season. You haven't had a great preseason. You had 10 days of COVID in there when you were in the penalty box. So it's. It's tough, not just physically, but mentally as well. You're away from home and, and coming down from the high of Leon as well is difficult. Just got to look out for Vancouver on the counterattack. Dahomey, Casado, like, yeah, I mean, th- they can do some damage there. That That's for me where the danger comes from. There'll be a good tussle between Omar and Cavallini coming up. This TFC team has more talent. There's, it's undeniable you hope that Toronto FC gets some players back. It, it sounds like Azorio's close, Mavinga's close. We saw more Moro and De Leon. If you can just get a couple of those names available for that game, I think it will just help out big time. Straight away, and, and I'm already picturing in my head, you've got kind of Oso and Pozuelo living be- between those lines. And Vancouver's two blocks of four, which caused all sorts of problems in that game at BMO after MLS is back. I think Josie, if he's fit, you know, he can really bully the two center backs of, of, of the white caps and cause all sorts of problems. Um, I think that that'll be important is hopefully cleaning up that treatment room. It doesn't sound like Pozuelo will be ready. He might be a little bit more off, but I think it's a realistic shout. The likes of Altador, um, Osorio, Mavinga. And also you want to be thinking balancing that game with Cruz Azul in the Champions League, which follows midweek. So um, getting those numbers back, whether it's for the weekend, even if it's a cameo appearance, then maybe one or two of those players can start midweek. Um, Then you start seeing the Toronto FC team that we're all really excited about. Just last mention on that, Terry. Um, It's also good to see the Canadian players playing in the Whitecaps team. We've saw so many of them feature for Toronto FC in these first three games, but Gutierrez is a good left back, Baldissimo, Cavallini, Tybert, he's been there forever. He's still in, in the team, as well as some bench players that you worked with at the under-23 Olympic qualifying, Metcalf, Raposo, those players coming off the bench as well. So really some a good Canadian foundation there as well. Yeah, Bro Guillard from Montreal, Waterman, Sammy Peter, Kamal Miller. Uh, yeah, I think gone are the days uh, where you just see one or two Canadian names uh, in, in MLS throughout throughout the league, even in the U.S., you'd, you'd be lucky if you got a handful. Uh, yeah, so it was a, it was a great weekend for, for Canadians, and um, by no means are they luggage out there either, using one of your words. Uh, I, th- I think they're contributing. I thought Baldissimo um, was excellent, ran the midfield, and, and he was the player that was going to help Vancouver progress up the field. It's taken time. I know there were some Canadian fans who are like, oh, play the Canadians all the time. Look, they need to be ready and they need to be good enough. And what we've seen through the development at these clubs, Toronto FC leading the way, you're developing players that are good enough to play at that level. And they've got to earn it, Will. But you need to be good enough. And right now we're at a point where these players are. You can't give anyone anything. You've got to earn it. And, and this is what the Canadians are, are, are doing now. They're ready. They're earning their minutes and saying, Coach, keep me in the team. Uh, let's wrap up this weekend's this week's podcast uh, discussing the Super League. We touched on it off the talk, off the top of the show. Uh, it's a developing story, so uh, we hope that you're familiar with what it's all about. I'm not going to break down um, the particulars of it all, but basically. 12, 15 teams, well, 12 teams specifically across European football have deemed themselves the gatekeeper of football and are establishing an American style super league where they'll all play one another. They'll control the finances in a league where there's no threat of promotion relegation. It's just essentially replacing a champions league tournament year on out. Um, They also want to 
remain in their domestic leagues as well, even though that the threat of promotion relegation really doesn't apply to them, Terry. And it will just continue to separate the haves and have nots across football An absolutely incredible cash windfall coming the way of these clubs while the rest will kind of squander whatever is left of the footballing pyramid. Um, this has obviously received incredible blowback from fans, even players, uh, people that cover the game across football. What do you make of what we've seen? I'm actually quite shocked that we've actually reached this point, that things have actually gone this far. Yeah, and when you say this far, I think LOIs have been signed, and uh, it, it's maybe further down the line than some probably – even want to think to admit, right? It's, it's, it's scary. And what's, what's dirty about it is it feels like it's going, going on behind our backs. It's, it's almost come out of nowhere. And I think what's happened is ownership groups from various places around the world, not necessarily super connected to their clubs where they're living and dying by each game or at games have said, how do we make more money? How do we take our investment to the next level? Well, it's ensuring that we're in, the Champions League, that's our biggest windfall and ensuring we've got big games which will attract more sponsorship. So to guarantee that, let's just create our own Super League. And um, the fact that there's not, they feel like there's a loophole or there's a way they can get this over the line is, is kind of scary. And uh, that there's so much tradition behind soccer and it's, it's built on, on, on supporters and so much history and to just kibosh that and say, we're going to go in this direction. Come on, man. It's uh, yeah. And, and going back to our, our, what we were just talking about before, I, I want to earn something. And, and I, I remember winning the Canadian championships. My first thought was I'm going to be in the champions league. I'm going to get to play in the CONCACAF championship and, and represent Canada and TFC over here. And, you're no longer earning anything and um, not to go on too much of a rant, but what does that do to the other leagues around the world or the domestic leagues in Europe? We were talking about this last night. Like now, if you're not in this league where everyone wants to be, what, what happens to the rest of the pyramids and domestic leagues? It's uh, it, it could be scary. And, and it's at the time right now of COVID where it's, it's already difficult. Um, I think the timing is um, isn't, isn't great, great at all. all. I think we'd all like to see big teams play big teams, big clubs play big clubs on a more regular basis. That's fine. But to go the opposite way that Toronto FC did their business over the summer where Ollie Curtis, Bill Manning said they wanted to go in with a scalpel, not a sledgehammer. They've gone in with a sledgehammer to the footballing structure that we've all come to kind of you know, I'm not sure if everyone, everyone loves it, but the commonplace structure that we're all familiar with that makes up the history of European football. That, that's what I find a little bit audacious is that the profits of few are being put above the well-being of, of others. Um, and to what end? Does this make a better climate for football? Maybe. I, I, this was just a huge gamble by the ownership of these clubs risking alienating their own fans worldwide saying, you know what, they'll get over it because every week you're going to see Chelsea play Bayern Munich or sorry, not Bayern Munich because they're not going in or Chelsea play Barcelona or Real Madrid, Manchester United, or, you know, Arsenal, AC Milan. Like these are the games and people will consume it and they'll love it. Was it naive of them to think that people would just roll over? Well, there was obviously going to be some blowback, but inevitably people will roll over and say, you know what? I support this club. I want to see the best players play, so I'm going to consume it. Uh, I don't think so. I think um, I, I, it's not fair. I, 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 I just think it's um, uh, an elitist move and, as a as a soccer fan myself, I love the Porto stories when Mourinho's team won won the Champions. I love the Bayern Leverkusen team that springboarded their careers and and players went on to play for bigger clubs because of it. Even the the Man United team with the young players were sharing them makes an impression laid on that. Man United didn't have the weight they had until after that moment, and and I think. Um, it, it, one of the 
things that we love about soccer is it can change so quickly and everyone wants an opportunity uh, to show what they can do. And this is just taking away opportunity and, and, and it's creating separation rather than inclusion. Right. I'm, look, I'm all about big games. I'm all about advancement, teams taking things forward, finding new ways to, to profit. But just ignoring the well wishes or the, the, the sentiment of the fans leads you nowhere. Like, I think that we here with Toronto FC, people that have been around for a long time, understand that the supporters have been the backbone. They've helped weave the fabric of this club and everything they represent. The lean early years where they weren't happy with the management of the team has taken this club to greater heights because they put their foot down and said, this is unacceptable. There was protests. There was town hall meetings that I'd go to. And it wasn't because of changing the entire structure of a league or football, as you know it, it was just making sure that the standards were up to an acceptable level and that the club was being treated, you know, treating, treating its supporters with respect. I just find it completely ironic when clubs can, you know, come out and say, you'll never walk alone or football is nothing without fans and then act like this. You understand Terry as a player. Like I would love to know what most players are, are thinking right now, not only in terms of the, the light of what that means to the, the fans who worship you on a week to week basis, but going into a competition full well knowing that you have to plug your nose, collect your big paycheck, but the competition itself, you're not going to earn your way into it on a year to year, year to year basis. It just seems crazy to me. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, and are they going to be big games? It's, it's great when the big games actually line up in the bracket and then you're, you're spoiled with, with when two big teams um, come up against each other. And so, sometimes even when the big teams meet, it's, it's a little bit of, stale because they they match up against the edge it becomes tactical so I, i'm not sure the product is necessarily going to be that great just because you have two big clubs actually meeting um fr- from a player's perspective it's uh i think with with no relegation and you know you're going to be in this competition you're in this squad and all the money's there this is where i want to be I, I think as long as you do well enough, you'll stay within that 12 to 15 or 20, however it plays out if it goes ahead, uh, which I don't think it will. Um, but it only actually get interesting in, in the final stages when you get to the final eight. Um, I, I, I think you'll actually see games that there's not a whole bunch on the line and, and you take away um, – scrapping for points and how important it is because you're either trying to get to the champions league or you're trying to get to the Europa league, or you're trying not to get relegated where every game does matter. Just a final thought on this. What makes those victories special is the road that it takes to get there. Clubs building, bringing through players, having to be savvy with their investments. And I know that the game has changed. I know that the PSGs and the Man Cities, you know, have followed the leads of the Real Madrids and the Manchester Uniteds of the world and be able to outspend other teams. We all understand what the footballing structure is like, but this is something altogether different. Like just, you know, if you're Arsenal or Spurs, like teams that are outside, what gives them the God-given right to be in this competition every year just because their owners have the money or, the, you know, or, or have jumped on this wagon? Look, like I think that this is heavily influenced by the American style of sport, whether it be NFL, MLB, even MLS, Terry. This seems like something that these owners would love to have an MLS type structure in European football. And you know what? It could work. Like we all love, we enjoy major league soccer here in North America. There is no promotion and relegation. So I get it to a certain degree, but coming in and without consideration, changing the footballing pyramid that's lasted for decades in European football, without concern for anyone else, where you're simply just lining your own pockets at the expense of everyone else. I think there's a proper way of doing things. And I still think that today that's the biggest challenge for major league soccer is that every game doesn't matter. If you're bottom of the table, yes, it matters for the coach. It matters for the player when you're fighting your job, but the club, if you finish last place, you're just going to get a better draft pick the next year. That's the nature of, of American sport or North American sport. And that's therein the biggest challenge to make every game relevant I think the, by nature of the history of soccer, the game, like that's what makes football so special, doesn't it? 
worldwide is that you play in a different, you know, you play under different grounds and under different circumstances where there is a genuine threat for the livelihood, for the well-being of your club if you don't produce. And I just think that this whole thing is short-sighted. I understand some of it, honestly. Like, I understand why these clubs or their owners would want something like this, but at what cost? And for me, it was a gamble too much and a step too far. Yeah. It's got to be a fairer way to the where w- within our framework of, of the Champions League, if something's not quite right or the owners feel like they're, they're not getting enough value, then, then l- let's do it within our own framework and, and kind of doing it behind everyone's back in this dirty fashion and going, you know, what? we're going to go do our own thing. We're going to take our, our toys and you guys just figure it out. And actually, you know what? We'll actually stay in your leagues. You're lucky to have us um, is, is a, is, is a bold move. And um, you know, I, I want to see our principles, our traditions uphold, upheld and, um, it's kind of ironic. The Champions League reform was actually supposed to come out later this week. Um, I'm sure that wasn't a coincidence that they beat them to it. Well, meanwhile, in this region, the CONCACAF Champions, Champions League is expanding where we can see potentially three Canadian teams every year between the MLS and Canadian Premier League qualify for that tournament. So, you know, I think that continental competition still hold a special place oh, yeah. and it's something that should be, you know, be grown or refined or made better, potentially see more significant rewards rather than ditch away and, 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 and you know, and make it so it's not a meritocracy. You got to earn it. And it makes it that much more special for not only the clubs, but their supporters to celebrate when you do end up accomplishing something along the way. Um That's it for this week's episode. Enjoy your week off, Terry. Next Saturday, TFC Vancouver Whitecaps. I'm going to get my vaccine this week, pal. It's the advantage of being the old age of 40. Shot in the arm for me this week. You'll have to wait. Sorry, pal. All right. All right. I'm happy for you, though. Thank you. I'm not like you. (laughs) <laughs> you're just not as distinguished no just just not as old as me yet it's coming but, but if you can yeah in the meantime i just want to say to all of our listeners make sure that you're out there you're staying safe you're doing your part i know how frustrating this has been for everyone trust me we've been screaming in our uh, in our homes, you know, and, and, and wishing our loved ones well, you know, in, in addition. And we just hope that you're doing what you can to keep you and yours safe during this very difficult period of time as well. All for one. we got to take care of one another. I want to thank our producer, Erica, my main man, Terry Dunfield. On behalf of everyone at TFC, I am Gareth Wheeler. This is Come on, you guys. Right.